Kira Koto, a very warm welcome to everyone uh, to our final webinar series for the year. My name is Chiwei Kwan, and um, I lead the leadership practice within Kerridge. I'm delighted to be joined this morning uh, by, with Scott Pritchard, and I'll, I'll do uh, Scott's introduction uh, in a very short while. We're delighted that you've joined us. Uh, we've got probably more than 70 senior leaders um, from the industry joining us this morning. Fantastic. Uh, just some housekeeping matters before we launch into the discussion. So first of all, uh, you would all have joined this webinar on mute. So just sit back and relax. Uh, a recording of this conversation with Scott will be uploaded onto our website. Immediately following this, uh, following the introductions, I will basically have a conversation with Scott for about 30, 40 minutes uh, out of the one hour we have together. And I strongly encourage all of you to uh, join in the conversation uh, in two ways. One is during my conversation with Scott, uh, by all means, go into the Q&A function and key in any questions you might have. And we'll make sure we try and address all your questions uh, when we get into Q&A. When I'm done with Scott for the first part, uh, we'd love to open this up to a real Q&A. And, and the other way that you could ask questions is literally click on the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll invite you in on video and voice. And it'd be great that you, you can actually ask your questions uh, over video. All right, so that's housekeeping. And I'll remind us uh, again along the way uh, in terms of how you might want to click the raise hand or key in it. Uh, anytime during the conversation, you can just key in the questions you might have for Scott. All right, let, let's get cracking. Uh, I just want to say a, a few brief words uh, about Scott's background, and then we'll, we'll get our, our conversation going. Scott, a very warm welcome. Thank you and once again, and then obviously taking time out amongst the last couple of weeks of work before Christmas to join us this morning. Now, Scott, many of you would know, has led the pressing, pressing team uh, since 2010 as a chief executive. So overall responsible for strategy and operations at the Pressing Property. Scott has extensive experience in property funds management, development, and asset management. And prior to Pressing, he, his previous experience included various property roles with NZX listed companies like Goodman Property Trust, Auckland International Airport Limited, and Urbus Property Limited. He's also a member of the Property Council's National Council and a trustee of Keystone Property Trust and the Tanya Dalton Foundation. Uh, warm welcome, Scott, once again. Well, let, let's kick off and get you to, to give us your take on um, the year that's almost gone past, right? Um, just, it's, it's been a challenging year to say the least. And obviously being in commercial property management development, I'd love to hear from you, what are some of your major challenges uh, today? And, and to what extent obviously has COVID impacted your business and your long-term strategy? Great, thanks Chi Wei and um, kia ora and, and good morning everyone. Um, great to be here uh, and thank you for the opportunity to come, and come along and, and have a chat. Uh, look, it's been, a, it's been an incredibly challenging year and um, uh, if I think about <clears throat> sort of uh, the state of our business back in March and the state of our business now, you know, we've, we've had to change quite significantly and really uh, respond and adapt to the new environment that we're now working in. Um, if I sort of work through the year and think about the impacts that we've had as a business, um, you know, late March, uh, our biggest project, which was Commercial Bay, um, the retail component of that was due to finish on the 28th of March and we were all set for opening and we went into lockdown on about the 25th of March. So that was a really uh, significant moment for us because um, you know, we had about 2,000 workers, construction workers on site. Um, we'd had a lot of our retailers already shift in a lot of their stock. Uh, we had a lot of the hospitality venues uh, full of alcohol and food and uh, and to shut the centre down and and, um, uh, and to do that for six weeks was really challenging. So those few days that we had between going from level two to level four was, uh, you know, was a, was a really, a uh, really challenging moment in time, but the team responded incredibly well and uh, we managed to, you know, secure the site and uh, and protect everyone's valuables um, during that phase. And then that really led into, <clears throat> um, you know, a period of time where we were all in lockdown and, and you start to think pretty quickly about what your priorities are. And obviously, you know, first priority for all of us is our family, but um, secondly, our staff and our business and 
and uh, we spent a lot of time communicating uh, with our team. Um, uh, from my perspective, almost we, you know, in many respects, we over communicated. But um, having talked to the team subsequent, you know, there was a lot of a lot of value placed on that regular communication that the team was team was benefiting from. Um, the sort of second major thing that we had to deal with was all of the contractual positions that we were in, and, and the thing the thing is with property development is that everything is driven off a off a program or a timetable, and so uh, when dates are pushed out uh, through events like a global pandemic, then that has quite a lot of consequences. So, you know, we had to work through that in, in an enormous amount of detail, and um, you know, Commercial Bay was impacted. Uh, we had other developments such as one Queen Street, which we were due to have started by now that we had to put on hold. Uh, and we had other projects that were underway where we had to apply the same principles as Commercial Bay. So <clears throat> uh, it was a really intense period of time and um, that five and a half weeks, six weeks where everyone was at home, you know, I know certainly our team were on calls like this uh, from, you know, very early in the morning to very late at night. And so you know, maintaining that communication and keeping the team up to date through all of that and working through the challenges that, that we had was um, was really quite significant. And then, of course, we sort of moved into the next phase, which was, you know, what does this mean for our investment portfolio and, and all of our occupiers and, um, you know, and, and, and are we still able to charge rent and do we still get paid and, and what are the implications of, of all of that? And so... Uh, once we'd sorted out all of our construction sites, we then sort of moved to all of our occupiers and started engaging with all of them. And uh, that was a really interesting sort of period of time because um, the level of engagement that we had with our occupiers was quite significant. And um, and it was really challenging. I mean, the, the most challenging occupiers for us certainly were, you know, some of those retailers that need their premises in order to be able to trade and you know, uh, whilst a lot of people look at our business and think that it's very large office towers occupied by some of the um, the biggest and most well capitalised companies in, in New Zealand, uh, we still have retailers and 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 businesses which are mum and dad businesses, SMEs, and uh, you know the reality for those guys heading into lockdown was that they just couldn't they couldn't generate any income. So we moved really really fast to try and support them through. Uh, through lockdown and uh, and gave them as much support as we could um, and ensured that they, you know, maintained a viable business once we came out of lockdown. Um, and then I think, you know, the the other sort of more longer dated impacts for us is, and we're still, we're still working our way through it now, is what does it mean for the office space? Uh, what does work from home mean? Uh, what does it mean for the city centre? And... Um, you know, those are issues that uh, we're continuing to grapple with. Uh, we're starting to get a few insights now, which is really comforting, but, um, uh, the, you know, there's no doubt that 2020 has, uh, you know, turned business on its head in many respects. And certainly for our business, it's imposed some really significant challenges that we've had to adapt to, certainly in the short term, and then in the longer term, we're still, we're still working our way through it. It was great to hear that you, you provided what you say as much support as possible for the small retailers, the SMEs. It must have been tremendous uh, financial pressure on you guys, right? On one hand, you know, you've got no revenue or short revenue, but you've got to provide whatever support you could. How do you deal with uh, pressures from shareholders? Yeah, look, I think um, we have a lot of dialogue with our shareholders. Uh, we have about 8,000 of them. Um, uh, we have uh, many shareholders from overseas. Our largest shareholder is the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, which is the largest sovereign wealth fund globally. Um, and I think uh, first and foremost, if you talk to any of our investors, um, they always encourage us to do what's right. And um, and if I think about how we treated our 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 retailers, um, you know, during that period, we offered them relief of their rent during the period that they were in lockdown. And um, and we did that very quickly. Uh, we also went out to all of our occupiers and offered them uh, forms of relief uh, over the rent that they were due over that over that first sort of two month period. Uh, and that was really a signal that we wanted to proactively put out to our occupiers to let them know that um, you know we are here for the long term. Uh, we want to see their businesses be viable. Uh, and you know what that triggered was a huge amount of. Um, engagement with our occupier base which was uh, which was really really good and positive and certainly strengthened I think the relationships that we have with all of our occupiers 
That's great, Scott. So I, I picked up phrases like do what's right, focus on the long term. What I'd like to do, perhaps, Scott, at this point, um, I'll come back to the business issue shortly, but I'd like to really, you know, find out a little bit more about how you've personally developed as a leader. So if I were to ask you to go back and look back at your career, what would you say were the key experiences that, that shaped who you are as a leader today? Yeah. Were there any sort of those what you might call crucible experiences that yeah, aha moments for you as a leader? Yeah, so look, I've got a really uh, a really interesting background, and probably a background that not uh, not a huge not a huge amount of people know about. But um, I I finished school. Uh, I went to Orewa College. Uh, I went to school. Um, uh, sorry, I went to Teachers College after school and trained as a as a teacher. Um, by the time I finished my teaching degree, I realised that I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> Uh, so I I, uh, I became a rescue fireman at Auckland Airport, and um, and so I did that for a couple of years, and uh, that was fantastic um, because while I was doing that, I was also doing a little bit of teaching um, as well in my off days because it's shift work, and it dawned on me during those first couple of years of work that um, I had a choice at that stage to either. Um, remain in a role like that, uh, which is fantastic, and it's a great role, and they do a great job. Or I could really challenge myself and um, uh, and give myself the best chance of being kind of the best version of myself, I suppose. And so, I uh, I enrolled in a master's degree in business, and um, uh, and I sort of went and saw my boss at the rescue fire station and said, "Look, this is what I'm going to do." And they were a bit surprised um, because most people that sort of join the rescue fire department at Auckland Airport don't leave. Um, and at least not for a master's degree. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they leave, but not to do a master's degree. Yeah, so I started studying. I got stuck into my, um, you know, my master's degree, and I was very fortunate that the airport supported me through that. Mm -hmm. And I suppose about halfway through my, uh, through my time uh, studying, they plucked me out of the rescue fire service and actually put, uh, put me into a procurement role for about... Uh, seven or eight months uh, and then thereafter I ended up in the property team and so um, you know I don't have a specific property degree uh, I have a, um, a degree in management um, very much focused on business and uh, but I was very fortunate to be directed into a division within Auckland Airport that allowed me to really you know, learn the ropes of property and, and um, you know the airport has an enormous property portfolio uh, I got to taste, um, you know, the aspects of managing property as well as developing property. Uh, and it was a really fascinating industry. And um, that really unlocked, um, frankly, my career. And uh, uh, that all happened uh, slightly north of 20 years ago. So it's really interesting to think back now and think about how I had such a varied start, um, but ended up in property and I really fell in love with it. I'm also curious, um, Scott, when, when you first took on your, what you might call people manager role, uh, what did you learn about yourself as a leader? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the biggest things I've learned is that um, my varied background uh, has really helped me a lot in terms of the ability to uh, engage with people. Um, one of the key principles that I'll always adopt is, um, is treating everyone the same. And, um, you know, I would hope that if, if anyone asked anyone in our business about um, how I how I treat everyone in our business or stakeholders or investors or, you know, clients of ours, um, the approach is irrespective of their title to treat everyone with the same amount of respect and, uh, and give everyone a hearing because, um, you know, everyone's opinion is really valued. And, you know, I, I still remember, uh, you know, when I started work at the fire station and there's a real hierarchy in those types of organisations and... Um, uh, you, you generally listen uh, and you're not you're not encouraged to speak a lot and so and it's a very um, it's a very macho environment and you have to learn to adapt and you have to learn to uh, to deal with people individually um, and then through my teaching that I did do I think I learned how to you know get the best out of out of kids and students and so I suppose I've had quite such a varied background that it's enabled me to um, I think have have a reasonable sort of um, rounding as a person and it enables me to deal with people and treat people really equitably and fairly. Fantastic. In particular, were there any sort of 
role models that you looked up to in your career with the individuals or, or you know people that you know personally or people that you see out in the broader industry that you look up to as role models yeah i mean i think uh, for me um because i had such a such a varied background um you know i do remember finding myself in the property team at auckland airport and um at that stage john galter was the ceo of of auckland airport and Auckland Airport had just recently been listed. Um, we had gone through an IPO process, and uh, you know, John was the boss, and um, and I was so intrigued as as to how, you know, how how much presence and how much money John had uh, around Auckland Airport, and there was nothing it seemed that John didn't know about the place, and um, and you could see very clearly that he was really driving that business for. Uh, you know, for the benefit of the business, and um, and I remember I remember that quite uh, significantly because I'd come out of um, you know such a such a as I say such a varied background, and then to see a person with such a driven, focused, um, almost single-minded mentality was uh, was really intriguing for me. Mm-hmm. And then um, and then since then, I've I've sort of there's been a number of people to be honest that I've I've looked up to over the years. Um, uh, you know, I worked for a guy called Murray Barclay, who a uh, very different type of leader to John and, um, you know, very calm, very relaxed, um, but very considered. And I, and I learned a lot from him. Um, I worked at Goodman Property Trust and I worked for uh, the, the current CEO there, John Dakin, and uh, very similar to Murray in that he's very calm, very considered. Um, and, uh, and I learned... Uh, you know, a lot from those guys about having a balanced approach and, and treating people, you know, very fairly. And and while I was at Goodman, I also got, you know, some exposure to Greg Goodman, who um, I think is one of, uh, you know, New Zealand's best businessmen. Uh, no, no question about that. And, you know, and someone like that, you, again, you get that glimpse of someone that's incredibly driven, um, very self-motivated and uh, and and, inc- and incredibly smart and um, knows how to get the best out of people. So I think I've sort of, I've, um, and there's been many others along the way, but I've really, I've really tried to take, I think, uh, the best out of a bunch of different role models and, um, and tried to adapt, uh, you know, I suppose what, what I think is most appropriate for me and really instill some of those principles and some of those values in how I behave and, and how I conduct myself. Fantastic, Scott. Um, I want to segue and talk a little bit more about sort of your, you know, global versus local leadership. Um, it's amazing, right? You grew up from where you did and then worked across being a fireman, being a teacher and all that. And I understand you spent pretty much all your career within New Zealand. And I'm really interested, you know, and obviously I, I think of the rest of the folks on, the, on this call would be, how, how did you get more global in your thinking? How do you develop your global perspective, given that pretty much your, your entire career has been in, in New Zealand? Yeah, like it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, for me, for starters, I don't think you need to have, um, have worked overseas to become a really good leader. Um, you know, I think, I think that that's a nonsense. Um, I think, you know, there's every chance that you can be a fantastic leader of business in New Zealand without having to have had that experience. Um, I've got a bunch of sort of global references, I suppose, that um, or reference points that I use and pick up on and and helps me to have a global perspective. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority is our biggest uh, our biggest shareholder in precinct. They're also a 50% shareholder in our management company. So, um, you know, I'm talking to them tonight. I talk to them most weeks um, and, you know, they probably have the biggest global footprint of any investor anywhere and so um you know and I, i've spent time with them here and in abu dhabi and so uh, that's a usual a useful reference point um mm. the other 50 percent shareholder of our management company is amp capital based in australia so uh, obviously spend a lot of time over there with them and they have a global footprint too so you know you're able to tap into these global networks which does give you uh, really good insights into what's happening globally, and then uh, and then you can consider how you can apply those things to uh, to what's happening in, in New Zealand. And I think the other thing is that you know for the last uh, sixteen years, um, uh, the last ten years here at Precinct and the six years prior at Goodman, um, 
I've always been engaged and have engaged with our investor base and, and you know, generally entities like ours have sort of 15 to 20% of all of our investors from offshore. So, you know, you know, you need to know how to engage with global investors. Um, you need to know what's on their mind and, uh, and what they're focused on. And so uh, that also ensures that you have to think globally whilst, uh, whilst you are operating locally. Fantastic. Uh, look, I, I fully am in agreement with you that you don't need to go offshore to be a great leader. And in the same vein, the fact that you've gone offshore and come back does not mean you're a great leader either. Um, and I love some of the things you talk about in terms of, you know, treat people fairly, they able to engage people at all levels, uh, putting yourselves in the other person's shoes, which are a lot of your, your overseas investors and so on. So that, that's fantastic. I'd love to get your views on, you know, I think sometimes we get into a debate of uh, global leadership talent versus homegrown Kiwi talent. Um, what's your sense in terms of what is it that makes us unique as Kiwi homegrown leaders? Uh, you know, what, what are we really good at that will help us thrive in a global role? And perhaps conversely, what are the things that sometimes sets us back from really stepping up to mm. I think um, I, I would say New Zealanders are the best generalists in the world. Um, and, and what I mean by that is in New Zealand, um, you don't have the same extent of specialisation that you do have in, in other roles uh, in other larger cities, certainly in the, in the property and construction in, industry. So to be a leader in New Zealand, you really need to have a good grasp and be able to do a range of things and um, understand all of the drivers within a business. And you know, you might say that that applies to uh, for any leader in any business, but I think in New Zealand, on your way through to becoming the leader of a business, you actually have, uh, you, you are required to do more things. And so uh, you become a very good generalist. And I think that's what Kiwis are very good at. Uh, I meet a lot of returning Kiwis who have been in the property and construction industry offshore and they, they operate in a really specialised area. And the challenge that they have sometimes coming back is then they've been asked to become uh, more of a generalist again. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that is quite challenging at times. I think the other, the other thing which I've touched on already is that when you're a generalist, uh, you have to deal with a range of different people. And so I think what that leads to is that New Zealand leaders becoming more in tune with what their people are doing and saying and how they're performing and managing you know, their performance and their well-being and all of those things. And I think being in tune with your staff is, is incredibly important. I'll say the other thing about um, operating locally here is that um, we have a very different environment. And if you compare how uh, business is conducted in New Zealand versus Australia, um, we're still competitive, but I'd say we're not quite as competitive as Australia. And there's a ruthlessness uh, in some of those other larger cities about how they conduct business, which probably is not as apparent here. Um, and you know, we had uh, we had a saying in our in our business here at Precinct ten years ago when I started, which was that we would leave the last dollar on the table rather than the last dollar counts. And uh, the reason for that was that um, we don't generally our market is our market and our ability to grow our market is quite constrained because our market is really, you know, large government occupiers or large professional services firms or large law firms. And if you, as a business like ours, where you're a, a, a large owner of real estate, if you get offside or you really fight for that last dollar all of the time, uh, then it's going to strain the relationship. And so, you know, we adopted that principle 10 years ago and I'd say, you know, we still maintain that principle now, which is which is one where at the end of a negotiation with an occupier, we want both parties to be happy. And I think that's really important for us. And that's a principle that we abide by. In terms of Kiwis going offshore and becoming, you know, more global, global leaders. Um, look, I think we've got some amazing global leaders uh, offshore. Um, you know, I touched on one before, and Greg Goodman. I mean, I don't think he gets he gets a whole lot of airtime in New Zealand, yet what he's achieved is simply outstanding. You know, he has grown a business over the last uh, 20 or 25 years now, which started in value at about $20 million. And it's, you know, I, I think it's worth about 30 billion now. And, um, you know, people like that, uh, 
are remarkable and they're, they're Kiwis on the global stage doing, doing amazing things. Um, sometimes we probably, uh, we probably need to put ourselves into the position of um, taking on the challenge and being bold enough to, to have the confidence to do that. Um, because in New Zealand, it's very easy to get settled uh, and enjoy the lifestyle um, and also have, have really great jobs um, because the, the environment here is so different. Um, mm -hmm. So look, I, I, think, I think there are plenty of global leaders um, that have been born in New Zealand and raised in New Zealand and have done some great things here. Um, and I just encourage more and more people to, to, to sort of, you know, stand up and give it a crack. Wonderful. Well, conversely, I guess also in the same vein, you know, we also pre-COVID, we continue to see a lot of uh, overseas talent coming into senior roles in New Zealand. Mm. Um, what advice would you give them in terms of really being successful when they come into this country? Yeah, pr probably be humble. I mean, I think we've seen, well, I certainly have, I, I, I wouldn't name them, but I've seen plenty of leaders come into, you know, large businesses in New Zealand from offshore. And, um, you know, it's very clear from the outset that, that um, uh, there's an attitude or, or an approach which is, uh, you know, incredibly competitive, somewhat elitist, and uh, there's not a lot of people, not a lot of focus on the people and, and how you treat people. And you know, I place a great deal of value on being humble and being fair and including everyone in, in the conversations or the decisions or the or the initiatives that we're um, <clears throat> that we are underway with. And and um, you know, I think there has been some really clear examples of offshore leaders being brought in by New Zealand businesses, and. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a miss, I'd have to say. And I'd encourage more boards of New Zealand companies to, to promote internally because we've got some amazing talent in New Zealand. Absolutely. In the same vein, I, I'm just going to actually look at a question that's just come through as we speak, which is very much on this topic. You know, uh, to your point, you know, can, can we back our own homegrown leaders a bit more rather than always be, be kind of tempted by the allure of an overseas talent? So the question that's just come through is, you know, What's your approach to developing and mentoring future leaders? How do you do that? Uh, what's your person? What's your philosophy in, in, in doing that? Yeah, so we, I mean, uh, we have very little turnover in our business. Uh, we have an enormous amount of homegrown talent. And uh, the approach generally is to bring, you know, new talent into our business at a very, at a very junior level and bring them through the business. And, um, you know, I've been here for 10 years now, and we have uh, a number of really highly capable people that are within our business that have been here now for seven or eight years. And, you know, one of the things I would say that um, from a succession point of view, um, if I was run over by a bus tomorrow, um, there, there, are more than, uh, there is definitely more than one or two people within this business that could step into my shoes. And I think that's, that's really exciting. And that's been uh, that has definitely been a, a very strong focus for us. Um, every, every year we commit um, a few thousand dollars per individual employee on their own training and development. Um, we have, and stick to it really strictly, uh, a six monthly review program. Um, we have dedicated training programs for, uh, you know, for our staff where we've identified where these areas to work on. And we place a huge amount of priority on our training and development. And um, was, was that cut during COVID? Was it cut? No, absolutely not. No, no. I mean, I think if you, uh, for me anyway, if you if you start cutting those types of things, then you know you 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 may not feel that impact in the short term, but in the medium and long term, you know, the capability of your organisation will be impacted by it. So uh, we've definitely maintained uh, and and prioritised that really highly. So. We place a, um, you know, we place a, a significant amount of importance on our on our training and development on our staff. Well, that, that's a fantastic story because you're probably not surprised that for a lot of organisations, that's kind of the first thing to cut, right? What what is uh, discretionary spending? Often, learning development programs get gets cut during crisis like that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to open this up to to questions from the audience very shortly. So, I just one more thing for you to to. To talk about Scott, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll try and see who, who wants to come on screen and, and ask you questions. 
You know, having gone through the last nine months of COVID, uh, and it's probably as good a crisis as anything we, we, we could have not thought about, what have you learned about yourself, uh, you know, in, resp in responding to the last nine months of lockdown and business impact? Mm. Oh, I've, I've tried to generally speak last <clears throat> in a meeting. Um, you know, so when, uh, which is quite hard for me to do, uh, to be honest, but I've, I've tried to, um, I've tried to let the room speak before I'll speak. Um, and I've tried to encourage as many voices as possible and opinions as possible and perspectives because it's really easy, uh, particularly once you've been somewhere for 10 years, which is what I've been now, um, mm -hmm. to become quite narrow-minded and um, to have preconceived views before you go into a meeting. And so I've really tried to challenge myself to, um, uh, to let you know, other people in the business um, make suggestions, um, you know, offer their opinion, offer their perspective, and then, and then encourage debate. And um, and we're seeing more and more of our younger uh, younger team members really come through and feel encouraged and empowered and comfortable to give us their perspective. And you know, I think I think for me that's been probably some of the most valuable most valuable learnings um, mm -hmm. uh, to remain really um, open to adapt, uh, to keep a really open mind uh, and to embrace the change. Um, because I mean, these types of crises are going to lead to change. And so ultimately those businesses that have the ability to adapt quicker uh, uh, will be more successful. And so, um, you know, and particularly one of the things I've picked out of this crisis is that, you know, there's been a huge reliance on IT and um, I can tell you, and some of my staff will laugh, that I am I am not particularly literate when it comes to IT, um, hardware, software, systems, whatever it might be. And so um, I'm really encouraging, you know, those people in the business that are capable in that area to really give me their opinion and to and to give me the why. And um, you know, we're we're up to embrace the change. And uh, I think it's been really enlightening for our business. Fantastic. The, the couple of questions coming through on, on the Q and A, but. Before I touch on that, and, and individuals might want to come on video, can I invite anyone who has a question that you want to pose to Scott to, if you are keen to put your hand up in the chat button, and we'll let you into the conversation. And I'll just wait a couple of seconds for, for people to see if anyone wants to do that, because there are other questions that's coming through the Q&A. So, yeah, the, the, the floor is open to anyone who might have a question and will be happy to come on video to ask Scott. While you're thinking whether you want to put up your hand, Scott, let, let me continue to, to with, the, the, with the question because uh, let, let's see how many hands are coming through. Um, I think this is a great question which came from, from the audience and is specific to what you just mentioned. You've been in the role for 10 years. Mm. Is there a good time to step away and, and you let the younger ones come through the ranks? Uh, and when's the right time to do that? Yeah, it's it's a really it's a really good question and um, particularly valid for me. Um, I've been asking that question uh, myself quite a lot. I mean, and I think when you get to the end of a particular phase in a business, um, uh, it's always a good time to reflect. Um, and COVID has definitely imposed some changes on our business, which will probably see me, you know, stay here for a little while longer. Um, uh, but it's a question that I've asked myself a lot and I can't answer it. Um, I think the things that I think about are, you know, am I still adding value? Uh, am I still a net contributor to the business? And, um, uh, and would the business be better off without me? Um, and, you know, sometimes I think uh, they're questions I've asked myself. Uh, for the time being, I think I'm, I'm hanging in there and I'm sort of contributing, but uh, one thing is for sure is that the moment I think that the business would be better off without me, then um, uh, you know, then I'll be out the door. Well, you've got a Christmas break coming up to continue to ponder on that one. <laughs> um, another question has come through, and I, I guess perhaps people are just uh, camera shy, but let, let me just replay the question to you. Have you chosen the roles in your career based on the leadership styles, culture, and reputation of the board or the senior management team? Or have you taken roles and then changed the culture of the team that you worked with, which is what you consider is more important? 
A uh, re really good question. Uh, so uh, the early parts of my career, I was just taking opportunities that were in front of me. And um, if I thought that it was a good opportunity for me to progress my career, then um, I'd take the opportunity and I'd go. And I think about that when I was moving to the airport and then I moved to a company called Urbis Properties, which was acquired by ING. And all that was really interesting and it really allowed me to learn about how, how a bunch of different um, companies operated. I then made the decision to move to Goodman and I did that because their culture was so good, the senior management was so good, their strategy was really clear and I wanted to be involved in that. And so um, that was really that was really obvious for me and it was a decision where I said, right, that's where I want to be, that's where I can learn and that's a company that is going places and I want to, I want to be on that bus. Um, it was quite different when I came to precincts. So uh, I had real difficulty, uh, to be honest, convincing myself to take this job, even though it was a promotion in the sense that I was a fund manager when I was at Goodman and becoming chief executive here was definitely mm -hmm. a step up. But um, at the time, precinct was no way near as advanced or sophisticated. Uh, it didn't have the staff or the systems or the processes that Goodman had. And so quite a different rationale for me to move into this role and, and um, ultimately once I'd considered the opportunity in quite a lot of detail I realized that the opportunity was in fact much much bigger because I could really have an impact here and um, I could really make the type of change that I wanted to make and uh, and the business had incredibly good infrastructure and good bones and all it needed was you know really good people and really good culture and in particular, a very clear strategy and the other things that we've really focused on in the last 10 years. And I think the business now is really benefiting from uh, from having that structure put in place, you know, over the last 10 years. So um, sort of two different answers, I suppose, for do two different times in my career. Um, given where I'm at now, if I, if I was going to move somewhere else right now, it would unlikely be to... Um, get on the bus of a business that's going well. Um, I've really enjoyed the challenge of actually sort of repositioning and, uh, and re-establishing a business and really getting the best out of it. Well, I guess it sort of speaks to the fact that you've got a couple more years uh, you know, behind your belt and you're a lot more sure about yourself and what I would say your, your true north is, your, you know, what, what's dear to you. Mm. And therefore, you know, you're not going to just compromise and get into the next higher paying job. Right, that, that's one theory. Yeah. Ah, oh, another one amazing question just come through, which actually was something I wanted to ask you. Uh, let me just just replay this. Uh, what is your biggest leadership challenge? And how do you tackle it? And how would would you do it any differently? You know, what was the biggest challenge that you had to, to deal with? Oh, it's a it's a really good question. Um, I think back it was about two thousand and thirteen, and. Um, you know, whenever you arrive in a company, you, you sort of want to not so much make your mark, but you really want to sort of start putting in place this the, the, the building blocks to ensure that the, the business is going to get on the right path. And uh, we'd made uh, a bunch of acquisitions of real estate in Wellington, and, and, we, and we held a view that, um, you know, we would redevelop these buildings for the government and, uh, and uh, well, we would make plenty of money out of it and it would really start repositioning the investment portfolio part of the building uh, part of the portfolio and um, and so we bought these buildings and then we um, we responded to an RFP for the government and uh, about six weeks or eight weeks later we got told that we would missed out we hadn't even made the first stage and um, I was absolutely devastated and uh, because up until that point we had a bunch of things get really go our way and um, uh, and it sort of felt like you were on a real roll. And then uh, we had the setback and it was really quite a material setback. And, um, you know, one of the things that I realized at the time was that everyone was looking at me and uh, within our business. And I really had to, I really had to provide, um, you know, support and balance and be really considered in terms of what I said and ensure that um, people remain really positive about uh, about our investment decisions and and what we were trying to achieve and it was incredibly challenging because at the same time you, you're doubting yourself and uh, you know you're questioning whether you've made the right decision so uh, that was a, a, a really a moment in time certainly in my career at precinct where I've, uh, I've 
I've really had to adapt and um, uh, you know adopt a persona almost that ensured that I was kind of looked like I was leading and that people would um, you know remain remain sort of uh, remain confident in the strategy that we had and as it turned out, uh, a couple of years later, uh, we were successful in that same approach. And um, and if you drive down to Wellington now, or you're in fly down to Wellington, and you see all of the real estate that's been developed behind the Beehive, that's all us, and that's a consequence of those decisions that we made many years ago. So um, the strategy played out, but we did have some moments where it was a bit hairy. So, so when you were at that low point, um, how did you pick yourself up? Did you have help from your personal network? Your who did you reach out to or you just dealt with it yourself oh look i'll be honest and say i just dealt with it um and uh and sort of spent a bit of time um thinking about what it was that uh was important for the business and what was important for the staff that had worked on it and the disappointment that the business was feeling and i was very fortunate that our board uh was incredibly understanding and um and also encouraging and uh, you know they were fantastic during that time um, yeah I didn't necessarily reach out to anyone for sort of you know personal chats but um, you know I definitely remember it as being a sort of a moment in time in my career where I really had to stand up uh, at a time where I didn't really feel like I wanted to um, but you sometimes you just have to. Now looking back would you have dealt with it or done things differently? Um, I certainly would have uh, probably changed our response in the RFP uh, in the first first instance. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I um, there was probably a couple of things that you you reflect on and that you might have done differently. Um, uh, but I think the the opportunity out of those occasions is to learn from them and um, uh, and that you know as a business we really had to adapt and learn a lot about you know the position that we had and. And, uh, and realized that we were in a competitive situation in every instance. And we really thought we had a very strong position and a position that uh, others couldn't compete with. Um, and it was really that complacent, complacency that, that let us down. And so uh, we've certainly found in every other competitive situation since then that um, we have never let complacency uh, you know, creep into our business. That's kind of a great segue into something I had wanted to ask you. Um, I, I, well, I don't know whether you agree, but I believe as leaders, we are never a finished product. So, you know, on a personal level, having been CE for 10 years and in previous senior roles, are there a couple of things that you still want to work on from a leadership standpoint? Uh, yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. Uh, I think we're always evolving. Um, you know, I've had, uh, if I think about how I operated 10 years ago to how I operate now, um, I'm, I'm, much, I'm a much better delegator. Um, I still find myself at times um, getting into a little, a little bit too much detail. And so there are instances in particular where I'm, I've been sitting in a meeting and I've realized that I'm really not adding any value. Um, and so I'm starting to be uh, more considered about where I participate and how I can have the most impact and be the most effective. And, uh, and, you know, one of the things that, one of the benefits you get when you're leading a business like this is that you're able to sort of talk to a lot of other business leaders and, uh, and get insights into what's happening in the market. And, and it allows you to be able to be sort of, to try and always stay a couple of steps ahead that so, so that you're making decisions that are not, uh, you know, that are not influenced by detail. And, um, and I think I've still got a bit of work to do there, um, uh, without doubt. But uh, but I feel like I've made quite a lot of progress in that area. It's an interesting question that just popped up. Um, if you look back at your career, Scott, what is the biggest regret? You know, <laughs> biggest regret. Uh, look, <clears throat> I don't think I have any, and I don't think you should. <laughs> I um I am incredibly incredibly grateful for sort of for where I am and the people that I get to work with because they are an amazing group of people and uh you know uh, just I feel I feel very fortunate to be in the position that I have so I don't I probably don't have time for to think about regrets too much I'm sort of copying out of the answer but um uh I, d I don't really, I don't really believe in, or don't really have any regrets. So, nothing pops to mind. 
That's fine. That's great. Hey, so if, if I were to ask your senior leadership team about Scott as the boss, what do you think they'll say in terms of things that they, they would wish Scott would be better at or to, to do more, to do less? What do you think your team would say? You didn't tell me you were going to ask this question. Well, I never told you what I was going to ask in the first place, Scott. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, look, I think they would tell you that I'm uh, relaxed, um, that I encourage people's opinions and perspectives, um, that I want everyone to be involved in decisions. Uh, I'm a strong believer in, you know, a collective view uh, is, is definitely better than individuals operating um, on their own. Um, uh, you'd need to ask them, I'd say, what uh, what they think I should do better. Um, <laughs> I, I, they don't tell me, so I don't know. Um, but I think they would... Have you asked them, Scott? Um, yes, every year. Every year. In fact, but they don't tell you. Yeah. The last question in, in any one of my performance reviews with any of my team is always, what can I do better and how can I help you more? And you know, there's been times where we've been um, under immense pressure and, and under immense time pressure, and sometimes, um, and some sometimes compromising people's time, which is a, a regular occurrence. Um, you know, that has happened at times, and I've tried pretty hard in the last couple of years to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, if you have a weekly meeting with someone that's scheduled in, then you make sure that you prioritise that and give them the, uh, you know, give them the value of that time. And um, as I've worked on those things over the years as well. Uh, but look, I think you'd find our team is, um, and I certainly hope that our team would be highly complimentary of working in this environment. Um, they certainly tell me that this is the best culture that they've worked in and, uh, and has the clearest strategy. So, um, you know, I take a lot of value from that. Fantastic. I've got a couple more questions and I do see questions also popping up through the Q&A. Um, let, let me just ask you, that, you know, I often get feedback from CEOs to say that they are very time poor. You know, there's never enough time for you to do your job. Uh, what advice would you give to, to people that are in, in the situation? You know, you never have enough time. So what do you do? What do you do? How do you manage? Oh, you need, you need to think about where you're most effective. And, um, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, about seven or eight years ago uh, when I, uh, you know, early on in my role here, and um, I used to deal with a, a, a chap called Rob Walker and Rob used to head up real estate for the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. So he had an incredibly senior role and he would travel 250 days of the year. And, um, you know, he told me that my goal in my job was to show up uh, without having anything to do. Um, he later told me that was never going to be achievable, but that was the goal that he gave me for the year to show up at work without having anything to do. Uh, <clears throat> ensuring that everyone was doing what they were supposed to be doing and that you were maintaining uh, an appropriate perspective um, and, a, and, a, and a more strategic perspective about the business. And that's always stuck with me. It's <clears throat> never been, you, you can never obtain that or achieve that as a CE, but um, it is a useful lens. And, you know, he was someone that had uh, and an incredible global perspective um, and was someone that I sort of talked to a lot about what was happening and, and, and how to become a good chief executive because, you know, when I was appointed chief executive here, I was only 36 and um, it was quite a, it was quite a step up um, and uh, it was very challenging and, and, uh, and I, and I was trying to sort of take um, feedback and advice from, you know, a range of people, but um one of the things I think more latterly in my time here is that I've definitely figured out how to ensure that, you know, my work-life balance is in check, um, that you're not getting overwhelmed by some of the risk that we take on, uh, you know, a billion dollar project um, and dealing with a global pandemic and dealing with program blowouts and those sort of things. Um, if, you, if you let that overwhelm you, it will consume you. And so um, you have to always sort of sit back, I think, and um, uh, adopt, adopt a more moderated perspective and one that actually allows you to make informed decisions and be really clear in your thinking. Um, if you start letting pressure get to you, if you start letting demands on your time get to you, you just cannot be a clear thinker. 
and really my job my job is about making decisions um, which are well decision well well considered and um, if I'm in the weeds or if I don't have enough time or if I'm feeling the pressure I'm just not going to be able to do my job well look that, that's a great point and I think you know making having the time to think and make the make strategic decisions goes back to what they said earlier about choosing how to spend your time at work right mm. uh, and I think you spoke about being able to delegate better, don't get too much into the weeds so that you do what you're paid for, which is really the big things. Mm -hmm. get, get involved in all the minutiae of day-to-day of -day business operation. Um, there's one thing that just came through, and I hope I'm, I'm representing the question in the right context from someone from the, the audience. Looking forward, how do you see your influence on company direction? Or is it more collaboration? So I, I'm just trying to interpret this in terms of, you know, to what extent are you able to shape where interesting property goes or obviously with the sh your shareholders and whatever, you know, industry or partners out there? Yeah, you know, uh, it's definitely a collaborative approach amongst our management team. Um, you know, and what started out as, um, you know, a direction that I was really keen to pursue, you know, nine or 10 years ago with the support of, of one or two others, um, you know, now it's a direction that we as a collective group uh, want to take um, with, a, with a really strong, you know, seven or eight person senior team and a board that's really well aligned with us as well. Um, you know, uh, and also a, a group of investors now that have, um, I think more, uh, more understanding and more clarity around where it is that we're taking the business. Um, I think the, um, you know, again, the principle that we've always adopted here is no surprises. So that's no surprises with staff. It's no surprises with the board and it's no surprises with with investors. And so, you know, the, the, the strategic direction that we have, um, we will continue to evolve it and it'll continue to um, be be tweaked as a consequence of some of the some of the issues that we're facing. But um, we will always uh, engage with the rest of our team with our board and with investors and make sure that we do that again in a, in a really considered way. Given that you've got some of the, the major players in terms of uh, sovereign wealth funds, and, you know, I'm sure it's a constant challenge in trying to balance what they look for in terms of investment returns versus what, what's possible. How do you deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, our goal is to be their, their best manager globally. And, um, uh, you know, we have had uh, plenty of feedback from them that uh, the way this business is run, um, the reporting, the engagement from management, uh, the engagement with the board is, is some of the best examples that they see from any of their global mandates. And so um, that's, that's something that we hold in incredibly high regard. Um, we work uh, really hard with them to ensure that we understand what it is that they, they are looking for. Um, and then that is a consideration. It doesn't become the sole driver, uh, but it's definitely a consideration that goes into the melting pot in terms of where we're taking the business. And um, and we do that with, with all of our investors. I mean, we um, engage with them regularly to try and understand what it is that, uh, you know, they're looking to seek from precinct and um, and where they place us. And uh, all of that type of feedback is, is regularly considered for us and, and incredibly valuable. That's great. Uh, another question which has just came through from, from the audience um, also, I guess, relates to the way that, we, you know, what you have put in your introduction. So, Scott, the question is, do you see yourself in a leadership role outside of business? And obviously, you know, you are involved with the uh, Keystone Property Trust and on Tanya Dalton. But I'd love to, to hear from you what, what you have learned in your board roles on these not-for-profit. Hmm. Uh, how much does that translate back to what you do? In a day job or, or vice versa? H uh, hugely. Um, I was just uh, last week, I've just been appointed as chair of the Property Council of New Zealand. So, you know, that's um, uh, that for me is um, a great milestone um, to, to lead the, the industry voice for property. And, um, you know, Property Council is an industry organisation that does an enormous amount of good. It's led by Leonie Freeman, who's a fantastic chief executive. And I'm really looking forward. I've been on the on the board there for the last ten years, but I'm really looking forward to 
sort of step into that chair while we're here and really driving some outcomes for for property generally. And we've got some really big issues that we um, that we need to take on with the you know newly elected government uh, and the likelihood of you know resource management reform and, and some of those things. So a big challenge ahead there. And I'm looking forward to operating in that governance space there in a, in a chair role. And I think that'll give me a really nice challenge. Um, the Tanya Dalton Foundation and Keystone are both um, trusts which are really dear to my heart because they are about encouraging you know, challenged youth into uh, into either sport with the Tanya Dalton Foundation or into uh, university for Keystone. And, um, you know, the role that I've played there is to really uh, ensure that those entities are, you know, well positioned, um, that they're sort of, you know, performing the role and meeting the objectives that they've set out to achieve. Um, you know, Keystone has been around for, you know, north of 20 years and has done some amazing good um, the Tanya Dalton Foundation, we set that up uh, with a close friend of mine, Dwayne Dalton, to honour his late wife, Tanya. And, um, we, you know, we set that up three years ago and it was incredibly satisfying last week. We just had our first um, our first group of recipients who have been on a three-year scholarship um, graduate. And, uh, you know, out of that group, we've got some amazing young female sports, uh, sports persons who... Uh, now in national honours and making black fern teams and doing some incredible things and so you know I think those those types of experiences for me really ground me um, they give me a perspective of of what it's like to be in, a, in an SME uh, where you're sort of really setting something up and getting going and, and you're having to do all sorts of things to try and help out um, but the most significant thing is to see the impact that you can have on these young kids. And it is just so satisfying to see them really achieve their potential and, um, and then some. And, uh, you know, some of the feedback we get has been just remarkable. So uh, really valuable for me to be, uh, to be involved in those entities. Fantastic. Another question that's come from the audience, which I, I guess kind of links back to what I asked you about your own personal leadership things that you want to work on. So the question is, is what, what do you do for continuous learning and growth? And how do you invest your time and what do you do? Are you a member of any organization you would recommend to other CEOs? And do you use a coach? So all in one statement. <laughs> I, I, I might be a bit of an oddity here. I don't, I don't, I don't have a coach and I've, I've never really had a coach, but I talk to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm always interested in getting people's insights and their, and their advice and their feedback. Um, I, <clears throat> I haven't done a lot of training and development. Um, so, uh, and I remember actually when I interviewed for this job over 10 years ago now, um, one of the things that was high on the priority list given I was as young as I was, was to do a lot of training and development. Um, what's happened is it's been incredibly busy and, uh, and I probably haven't done as much as I would have liked. And, um, you know, I still think there's an opportunity for me to do more. And I'm, I'm quite interested in doing that, particularly now that some of our sort of most significant initiatives have, um, have been uh, concluded. So uh, that, that needs to become a priority for me. And it's something that I probably haven't been as good as I should have on. And is there any sort of formal support network or organizations that you're part of that can help you with your learning journey? No, there's not. I mean, I'm not. I don't have any uh, any networks or groups like that that I'm actually affiliated with. I've got a very a very good um, uh, and some very close friends, uh, ex colleagues, colleagues that I am able to share with. I'm really fortunate here at Precinct to have worked with uh, my chief operating officer and my chief financial officer, George Crawford and Richard Hilda. Um, George and I have worked together for 16 years, both at Goodman and here, and, uh, and Richard, I've worked with Richard for sort of 13 or 14 years. So we are very, it's very unique to have that environment. Uh, and we're very fortunate because we can be really honest with one another. Uh, we can challenge one another. Um, we're, we're friends, colleagues, but um, it certainly doesn't stop us um, not agreeing with each other at times. And I think that's really healthy. But but also, if we need a bit of support, um, we're definitely there for one another. So uh, very lucky to have a group like that around me. We're fast running out of time, uh, Scott. I, I do have one more question, which kind of links to something that also pops out from the audience, right? Um, 
I understand you're a really keen sports person and, and love to, to understand how, how, what have you learned from the sporting arena that you can apply back in the corporate setting. And I think in the same vein, the question that came up was, where do you find time to think? You know, where, where's your balance or work-life balance? Yeah, I did a lot of surf life saving when I was younger and I had the, had the good, good fortune of, um, you know, being a New Zealand representative and, um, and that, uh, that was really useful for me because it, it sort of certainly allowed me to uh, express my competitive side and, and, I'm, and I am competitive. Um, uh, <clears throat> currently right now, I will uh, do a bit of swim training um, and I will surf as much as I can. And surfing is really interesting. It's quite cathartic. And um, it's also really interesting because, you know, you can, uh, you can be the chief executive of a, you know, three and a half billion dollar property company and do lots of amazing things. But if you, when you paddle out into the surf, uh, it's a whole new hierarchy. And <laughs> there can be a 14 year old kid that's a really good surfer and, uh, and you have to give him or her the respect that they deserve. And so I really enjoy that. It's incredibly refreshing. Um, I kind of lose the, I lose the pressure and the, and the, um, and all the challenges that come with being a chief executive and it allows me to relax. And actually, um, I do a lot of thinking when I'm surfing um, because you're in a completely different environment. And uh, that's certainly a way in which I'm able to um, take the pressure off and relax. And it's certainly a bit of advice I'd give anyone is to make sure that you've got some outlets uh, when you're in roles like this so that you can actually de decompress and detune and and, and not become overwhelmed by some of the challenges that you put yourself, challenging situations that you put yourself into. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic story to end off a, a literally one hour conversation, right? The fact that you can learn from a 14 year old, uh, I think it kind of, that's to your point, keeps you very grounded that no matter how good we think we are in our day job, there's always things to learn from, you know, people that are much younger than, than we are. And in terms of people with different background, different skill sets, um, Scott, it's been amazing. We could go on and talk for another 30 minutes, but I also want to be respectful. We've just gone past the hour. A very big thank you to you for really uh, taking time out. And I'm seeing you know, everyone's trying to get things done for Christmas. So thank you so much. And also a big thank you to all the participants who took, take, took the time to dial in and join the conversation. And thank you for the questions. Um, there are a couple of other questions that we didn't have time to respond to, so I apologize for that. Uh, I just want to close by saying, you know, uh, thank you to everyone. And, and uh, I'm sure everyone's looking forward to the two, three, four week break that's coming up. Whatever you do, stay safe. And uh, on behalf of Carriage and Partners, thank you. Happy holidays. And we look forward to connecting with everyone in the new year. Uh, till we meet again, stay safe. Yakaha. Thank you. Signing off. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, Bye.